Good afternoon and welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining our uh, archaeology and art history program. I believe we have about a little bit less than 300 participants from all over the world attending. So thank you all of you for your enthusiasm uh, in this program. As a reminder, uh, this program was crafted for uh, BA level students, but it seems to have gained quite some popularity uh, from a much wider audience of scholars and professionals uh, from art and cultural institutions. So a warm welcome uh, to all of you. So today we'll have a, a double uh, webinar session by uh, Dr. Natalie Ong and Dr. Sandra Sarjono, who will address relief sculpture, dress and textile representations in Southeast Asia. As most of you already know, these are two art forms uh, that reached a high degree of sophistication in many areas of both continental and island Southeast Asia. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our first uh, speaker, Dr. Nathalie Ong, uh, who is based in Singapore. Uh, Dr. Ong recently gained a PhD from the National U University of Singapore, NUS, and an MA in Indic Cultures at the Sorbonne Université Paris 3. Uh, she has been actively involved in projects with the Southeast Asian Ceramic Society, the NUS Museum, uh, Baba House, uh, also in Singapore. Uh, she has been involved in uh, other uh, research endeavors for the National Heritage Board in Singapore. And she's about to uh, start and or I think has already started a short fellowship with the University of Airanga in, in, uh, in Indonesia. And I'm very uh, happy to uh, mention also that she's just been awarded the uh, THRC Visiting Fellowship 2021-2022. Um, I will introduce our second speaker, Dr. Sandra Sarjono, after Natalie's talk in about uh, 30 minutes. We'll have uh, then a Q&A session at the end of both talks. So we will be together for another uh, hour and a half. So before uh, giving the floor to, uh, to Dr. Ong, uh, allow me a brief note on this webinar rules. Um, the Chatham House rules apply uh, to this seminar series. So I would like to remind our audience to uh, avoid making screenshots of the presentation slides. Uh, please also use the Q&A option uh, on your uh, Zoom uh, uh, below the, 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 your screen, uh, the Q&A option for your questions and please indicate also your name and affiliation um, before you ask the question. Um, please use also the chat option to report any technical issues if you have any. And I think this is it for me. Nathalie, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, hi everyone. I'm Natalie, uh, and thanks, Helen, and uh, IC's Yusuf Ishak Institute and the Thomasic History Center for inviting me to the spot. So, obviously, today I'm here to tell you and talk to you about uh, Asia, Southeast Asian relief sculpture. Um, so, for let's start with a question Does everyone here know what relief sculpture is? Um, okay, uh, that was supposed to be a poll going on, but I'm not sure that's happening right now. But um, take a look at the next three images, and it would be nice if you could tell me if. Um, um, if the images have anything in common. So there was also supposed to be a poll. And actually, uh, sort of. Um, yes, they do have uh, a few things in common, being naturally that they are all in relief. Uh, they're not flat and they cannot be separated uh, from their surfaces. Um, so we can actually characterize uh, relief sculpture as 3D modeling on a 2D plane, which mixes features of sculpture in the round and painting to make reliefs. So uh, sculpture in the round just means that you can go around the 
the image and you can see it from almost every angle. Well, obviously on a painting, it's flat. And so a relief sculpture projects from a surface, but it's also limited in angle. Uh, all right. So characteristics of relief sculpture are that it has depth and space. Uh, space is clearly limited by hor horizontal and you know, vertical limits. Uh, and for depth, we have high and low reliefs, which are often known by their uh, French names, au relief and bas relief. Um, so on these examples here, the, the extreme uh, versions of the reliefs, very high relief and very low relief. By high relief, we mean that we can, the sculpture projects very far away from uh, its surface. In this case, you can almost see Ganesha's crown from the back. And obviously from very low relief, it looks just like um, lines that have been inscribed on. Most generally, however, we have uh, low reliefs called bar relief, or you can pronounce it the English way, bar reliefs. And usually we find them on architecture, as you can see here. On architecture or inserted into a space uh, in the natural environment. Uh, here, a rock shelter has been carved uh, and decorated on the outside and on the inside. Um, you can carve natural landscape. There are lots of examples from all over uh, Southeast Asia. And there are also uh, examples where they are carved onto non-movable items. So ritual items, statues, trees, Sima stones to mark boundaries, the Dhamma chakras for the wheel of law. And again, most often they are on uh, architecture and ritual objects. So how do we make them? Uh, these are the techniques. Most depend on the type of materials that you will be using. The first one, we talk about molding. To mold means to shape and to form. Uh, in this case, uh, so for we mold uh, ceramic and plaster, which are malleable materials. Um, and we won't usually make molds of these. For example, here, uh, these are one-off and not mass-produced, so that would not require a mold. For the additive technique, this occurs mostly with ceramics. It means adding onto a surface. Uh, on a ceramic, you would have made the jar already and then shaped a piece of clay uh, into the shape of a, and, and put it onto the jar and then shape it and probably carve it as well and then put the glaze on before the whole thing becomes inseparable from the surface. Uh, the subtractive technique is the most common and we will use uh, Borobudo's uh, hidden base reliefs uh, as an example here. Uh, so you, what you see today, this reconstructed version, uh, shows actually a large base uh, foundation around the actual monument. I mean, this is also original, but it has been added on hypothesis, hy hypothetically because uh, the monument was probably structurally unstable and the creators needed to shore up the base so that the monument wouldn't co co uh, collapse. So uh, when they shored up the Borobudo's base, uh, there were a lot of, there was a whole series of relief sculptures that had been uh, unfinished. So here in this example, we see a very unfinished one. The stones have been placed and smoothened. 
uh, probably uh, the the head uh, creator would have said would have outlined the images in chalk, and then the sculptor would come in and carve away vague outlines in the first place, and then he start carving a relief one by one. I mean, a figure one by one. Uh, here we can see that the sculptors have worked are working in three sections, uh, and also carved the uh, arms, legs, faces, outlines of them. And then they start uh, carving, uh, start carving uh, in detail. So other examples include people who specialize in trees, for example, here. And other people would probably have specialized in different types of architecture, trees, flora and fauna, parts maybe. And we see in this relief at the bottom right that uh, the sculptor has taken its time to finish each figure before moving on to the next one. Uh, so all these examples that we've seen so far have been very monotone, but it's very likely that um, all the reliefs would have been colored or plastered and colored. We can see a, a late example here from the 17th century in Ayutthaya. Uh, the stucco is peeling off the statue or the relief. We can see remnants of the pigments. And because uh, pigments and stucco are all made of organic, uh, organic material, we don't have a lot of remains on uh, places like Borbador. And this practice is still going on today, uh, as you can see on modern Hindu temples. So we've seen also from all these categories, uh, all these reliefs, that there are basically only two types of categories. The so first type is decorative and ornamental. Uh, Sandra will be talking about this motif here in her talk later. It's basically what it says. It, it does what it says. Decorative. Uh, it's decorative and ornamental. The second type is a figurative meaning that we, uh, we represent objects and animal or human figures. A subcategory of figurative reliefs include iconic, meaning that it represents an idea, here an unknown animal. In the middle, we have a, a conch representing uh, the god Vishnu. And of course, all statues are iconic uh, in that they represent the idea of a god. Uh, the other subcategory of figurative is narrative reliefs, in which uh, the sculpture tells you a story or an episode of a story. So why would people spend so much time and effort um, uh, on, on making and studying narrative, uh, I mean, relief sculpture? Two perspectives from the part of the patron, on the part of the patron, you would gain power, reputation, and merit. Uh, power just means that he would show his enemies and his allies that he can command a lot of people and has the means for such massive projects. And of course, he gains good reputation by doing so. Uh, in terms of merit, in the Buddhist sense, you pronounce your faith and show it by building and repeating all these Buddhist tales, but also in the Hindu sense, because you are doing your duty as someone of uh, the ruling class or the elite by, uh, by building these monuments for the greater public good and also employing the stonemasons and the artisans uh, for work. So of course, as historians and archeologists, we study these to gain new knowledge. Uh, there are many ways to gain new knowledge. I'll be talking about three here. 
the circulation of ideas, uh, Sandra will be talking more about that as well. So let's start with tracing origins. So on the right, we have uh, an image uh, of how the Chandi Lor Jonggang was found initially, uh, actually late in the 1780s. Um, at that time, nobody knew that uh, this, the largest uh, Hindu monument of Indonesia had also the world's longest repre representation in stone of the famous epic, the Ramayana. It wasn't only, it was only until the 1880s that the Dutch started excavating uh, the site of Lower Jongram. And on the right, you see here in the foreground, uh, all the stones in a jumble. Uh, Chandi, the main temple of Chandi Shiva has been uh, cleared, but they, they actually found all the stones in a big mess. And the guy responsible for excavating the site found a block of relief with uh, a monkey. So he hypothesized that it was probably the Ramayana because it is a tale which, in which monkeys have the most uh, presence. And this allowed them to reconstruct the, the whole series. Of course, this is where they start running into problems. And uh, they found that there were quite a number of episodes that were, that were not uh, um, spoken of in the Indian Ramayana, such as this scene where someone is being crowned and this other scene where Sita is giving her ring to Jatayu the bird. So where did these uh, episodes come from? Thanks to Studeheim, a Dutch scholar, he spent a lot of time looking through a lot of Ramayana stories from around the region. And then he realized that uh, these episodes were strongly influenced by the Malay version of the Ramayana called the Hikayat Suri Rama. Uh, so what does this mean actually? Uh, what's interesting is that, first of all, local versions of the famous epic were already in existence around the eighth century. And, uh, were used uh, in circulation. Uh, so they reached the Javanese or the Javanese went to uh, find them, came into contact with them. And the Japanese creators um, did not copy from the Indian versions wholesale, but picked whatever they used that seemed to suit them. We don't know what the motive, motivations for such a, uh, thing would be, but it's also interesting that when you know that the current versions that we know of are written in Jawi, which is uh, using Arabic script to uh, write with the Malay language, uh, and that Arabic script only arrived in Southeast Asia in the 14th century, this means that the Hikayat Sri Rama is much older than the existing versions that we know of today. So, uh, and that's how we trace some origins. Obviously, this leaves a whole lot of questions. So, on to the next way of gaining new knowledge. Um, unlike Khmer, culture, ancient Khmer culture, Indonesian uh, inscriptions are not fixed onto a, uh, a, an architecture. And Khmer inscriptions also always have a date and the reign of the kings and the motive for uh, establishing the, the temple. Uh, Inscriptions in Java are found near sites and not on sites. Uh, so when you especially take into account the fact that uh, 
uh, central Java, for instance, is very, very dense in monument building. This, for example, is just the Prambanan plains. Uh, the, the inscription that I showed you in pieces was found in the vicinity of these uh, monuments. And we don't know which one it belongs to. So one way to help uh, uh, establish the dating of a, a monument would be to do stylistic analysis. Uh, I'm going to go through this very briefly. Uh, Dr. Marika Klok from Leiden University has already done a lot of work on this. Uh, and she has established that there has been a development of the color motif um, from A to the E uh, example. And these are what we see from the East Javanese uh, period after 929 CE. Um, in the 10th century. Um, but obviously, this is not the only thing that you have to consider. Uh, take, for example, I'll give you a very modern example. Uh, there are many other factors to, to consider as well. Um, if you take the e-scooter away from these people, they would still not fit into the context that is being shown. So what I'm trying to say here is when you try to date something, uh, there are several factors you have to take into account, including the form of uh, her clothes, her hairstyle, the spectacles that she's wearing, even her attitude. Um, so everything is connected and you can't just use one thing to date, but it can help where there is no, or where there is no writing or, or um, where there is no writing or, things that are difficult to decipher, or there are things that are difficult to decipher. And for the third uh, uh, way to gain new knowledge, uh, I'll be using some examples from my own uh, PhD work on the Lalita Vestara and the Ramayana. As you can see from the reliefs that I have shown you, uh, most of the bar reliefs are intensely occupied about talking about people. People are everywhere. And so um, early scholars have uh, attempted to, to discuss the issue of social hierarchy from the way people have addressed. So what I did was tabulate uh, all the ornaments that a person is wearing. Um, you can see from here, the higher the values obviously means the higher his hierarchy is, he, social rank is. Obviously he is also much larger in size and he has been framed by architecture, but uh, the values also correspond to his central place. The other interesting thing you would note here is that the men are uh, have been colored in blue, while the women have, are in orange. This kind of configuration is, shall we say, a little bit timeless. Um, it is meant to tell you something about the central character. Uh, so the question here is, do we also see this sort of thing in other types of narrative beliefs? The answer is yes, we do. Uh, the Ramayana, for example, uh, shows Rama here, surrounded by more women. Uh, the segregation of the women and everybody else is a thing that we already know of for uh, East Javanese uh, writings. Uh, in the epic poetry of East Java, uh, they talk about how women uh, uh, have their own palaces and uh, have their own social lives as well. And this is again the same thing we see in uh, more of the other reliefs. So it's not a uh, one-off representation. I don't have time to show you all the examples, obviously. Uh, so the women here are cloistered in a palace and in addition they are bracketed in the front and the back by armed guards. 
The other uh, interesting uh, aspect of a social practice is in this and the previous relief, all the laborers are always placed on the edge of the panels, as far away as possible uh, from the main high status characters. What does this mean? Simply that there was a type of social segregation by class, by gender, and uh, by occupation. And here, I think it might be most obvious, uh, the religious folk are celebrating and feasting while the common folk probably feast on. So in summary, we can talk about the reliefs, uh, the characteristics of the reliefs. There is the depth, space, and location to think about. Uh, the types of reliefs there are high and low, the materials that they are made from, various types of materials and the techniques that help make them, and the categories of uh, reliefs, decorative, figurative, iconic, and narrative, and how we gain new knowledge by this. So if anyone has any questions that I will not be able to answer in the following Q&A, please feel free to message me here.